in July of 2007, the Pepsi 400, that's a NASCAR race for some of you who need to know that, the Pepsi 400 NASCAR race took place July 7, 2007. That's up on the Daytona International Speedway. The track is two and a half miles long. When they run the Daytona 500, that's 500 miles. When they run the race in July, it's a 400 mile race, and so they only run in July 160 laps. On that night, July 2007, they had run 160 laps around this two and a half mile track. They had run almost, coming down to the last lap, they had run almost 400 miles. How far apart would all of these cars be, starting with 43, I don't know how many finished the race at this point, but starting with 43 cars, how close, I mean, how far apart are they going to be after 400 miles? They came down to the end of this race, and Jamie McMurray just barely, but he did beat Kyle Busch, and that's nice, just barely beat Kyle Busch by a margin of five one thousandths of a second. But he came in first. But it was close. You say, that's really close. It's not the closest race in NASCAR history. That was in 2011. If you go, uh, that was in 2007. If you fast forward to April of 2011, but now you've got to go out to Talladega in Alabama, a track that's a little longer than two and a half miles long. And they go out in, uh, in April of 2011 racing what was called the Aaron's uh, 499 race, a race that would uh, last for 188 laps out of, around this track uh, at going 500 miles. So think about it. They're going 500 miles, 188 times around this track, 43 cars. At the end of the race, they're not going to be close, are they? I mean, those cars are going to be so far apart, except they came down to the end of this race you see Jimmy Johnson's car, the number 48, up at the top of the screen. You see Clint Boyer's car, the number 33, down at the bottom of the screen. And by a margin of two one-thousandths of a second, Jimmy Johnson came in first place. That's close. But he still won. You say, it can't get any closer than that. By millimeters, by millimeters, you got to go back to 2003, and you got to go to Darlington in South Carolina, a shorter track, less than a mile and a half long, so there's going to be a whole lot more laps around this, this track that's less than a mile and a half long. The Darlington Raceway, when they race there uh, on this race in March of 2003, they're going to run around it 293 times in order to get their 400 miles in. Surely by the end of 293 laps, they're really going to be spread out. No, I remember that race when Ricky Craven just barely inched out, but thankfully he did beat Kurt Busch because nobody likes it when Kurt Busch wins. Thankfully beat out Kurt Busch. The margin was the same, the two one-thousandths of a second, but just by millimeters, it was a little bit more than the one in 2011. That's really close. That's, as far as history goes, since the 1993 when they invented the whole, the whole tracking mechanism, that's the closest race in NASCAR history. All right, then what's the one where the widest margin of victory, at least in their recorded history? you got to go back to 1965. Same track in Darlington. September of 1965, they're running the, seven, the, southern, four, the southern 500, 500 miles around this track that's less than a mile and a half long, so they're going to run around this track 364 times. 1965. You know what it means when a car laps the field, right? You know what it means that when a car has lapped the field, it means that he has gone around the track one more time than anybody else on the field. So everybody else is a lap down. He has gone around and passed everybody else on the field Everybody else is a lap down at that point. You know what that means, right? So on this occasion, Ned Jarrett was racing around 364 laps around Darlington. And at the end of this race, the second place card, Buck Baker, well, here's a picture of Ned Jarrett's car. 
you'll notice that Buck is not, you, you notice the other pictures that everybody was close. The second place car in this race was 14 laps behind Ned Jarrett. Not five one thousandths of a second, not even one lap behind him. 14 laps behind him. I would say that Ned Jarrett won that handily. I would say that uh, he could have coasted across the line and been just fine. He won the race. He was in first. You see, some of these races are really close. Some of them are a lot further apart, but the reality is that at the end of the day, somebody comes in first. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Jesus tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. That means in our lives, Jesus used the word kingdom here for the word church. That means in our lives that the church has to be first in our lives. But how close does it have to be? Right? I mean, Ricky Craven was in first. He beat Kurt Busch by two one thousandths of a second, but he was in first. How close? When God says, seek ye first the kingdom, how close? Is it to be 14 laps more than the one that's in second place? God says, seek first. How close should this be? I think that's the mentality that some of us have when we see the word first. We think about a race, perhaps, like NASCAR or some other race, and we think this person comes in first, it doesn't matter where the rest of the field was necessarily behind them because first place is first place. And so as long as the church is first place in my life, then it doesn't matter how close everything else is, except that's not the way that the Bible is using the word first in this verse. So I want to share with you, before we, before we make application of what this verse means in our lives, I want to share with you, what does the word first mean? And I know you could get an English dictionary out and look up an English word first in it and, and find some English, but I want us to just talk about the Greek word protos because that's the word that's used here in Matthew 6, verse 33, and it's used dozens of other times in the New Testament. But according to Greek scholars, that word protos is used in different ways. What do you mean? It's just the word first. How can it be used in different ways? Sometimes it is used to talk about something being first in time. Mark chapter 16, verse 9, Jesus arose on the first day of the week. What day? The first day. The first day in time, He arose on the first day of the week. And so there's that time element. Jesus told church in Ephesus in Revelation 2 and verse 5, go back and do the first works, the works that were done first in time. So sometimes it's used first in time. Similar to that, but different. Sometimes in the Greek language and in the New Testament, the word first was used to talk about first in a sequence. And so Jesus would say in Matthew 7 and verse 5, He would tell us, tell His disciples, first remove the plank that's in your eye, and then you can see clearly remove the speck that's in somebody else's eye. You see the sequence? First is the plank from your eye, and then is the, is the speck out of somebody else's eye. Paul would say in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 13 that Adam was formed first and then Eve. There's a sequence. When Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, which one of these is he talking about? Is he saying that the church needs to be first in time? That our seeking of the church is to be first in our chronological time? No, that doesn't make sense because we've done a whole lot of other things in our lives before we ever did that. Okay, is it sequence then? Does he say, seek first the kingdom in sequence and then go and seek something else? According to Greek scholars, it's not used in either one of these ways. It's not used about time, and it's not used about sequence in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. There's a third way, and by the way, this isn't the way either. There's a third way in which the word is used, to, the word protos is used in, in the Greek New Testament, and that's to talk about something that's first in rank or first in value. What does that mean? Well, it's divided. One, sometimes it's used first in rank when it comes to things. Uh, something that, that would be first in, in a rank or a value. When uh, I, I, My favorite one is in Luke 15, verse 22, where the father told 
commanded that the best robe be brought out for his prodigal son. The word best is the word protos. The word best is the word first. He told them, go into the house and get the best. He didn't tell them to get the first robe they came to as in, as in time. Don't just go in the house and the first robe you see, bring it out. He was talking about ranking the robe, the value of the robe. What was the, what was the best robe that they could find? That was the robe that they were to bring out. And so sometimes, sometimes the word is used to talk about things uh, as, as, as being of a, of a better, of a higher rank or value. The, the lawyer who came to Jesus and said, what's the first commandment? He wasn't asking chronologically what's the first commandment. I mean, what would, chronologically, what would the first commandment be? Be fruitful and multiply? I mean, that's, uh, you were going to find a commandment you know, earlier than be fruitful and multiply. What, what's the first commandment? Is, is, it, is it the first of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods before. No. Jesus understood. He wasn't talking about chronology. He's talking about rank, value, the greatest. Love, love your neighbor, or, or love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. But sometimes it's used to talk about people. Sometimes this, this, that, this talking about rank or, or value is used to talk about people. And so Jesus would talk about someone who desires to be first in Mark chapter, Mark chapter 10. Who, whoever desires to be first, not chronologically, not in time or in sequence, but whoever wants to be the best, whoever wants to be the highest in rank or value. So there's, and Paul would in 1 Timothy chapter 1 say that he was the chief of sinners. That word chief is the word protos. He's not talking about he's the first sinner in chronology. That wouldn't make sense. He's talking about in rank, I'm the first. You, put it, you line up the sinners, I'm right there at the top. But Greek scholars tell us that's not the way that is used in, Mark, in Matthew 6 and verse 33. In fact, some Greek scholars would tell you that the use of protos in Matthew 6 and verse 33 is unique to all of its other uses throughout the Greek New Testament. It's not talking about first in time, first in sequence, or first in rank. Instead, it is talking about something that is first in degree. What does that mean? The way they define this word, the Greek scholars, the way they define this word is that this means it is to be first above all everything else in life. Not just make a list and put it first. Not just make up your calendar and put it first. Above everything that is in your life, it is to have supreme importance. Above everything else in your life, it is to have exclusive, not with other things with it, not with other things in the same category. What God is saying is if you take that NASCAR mentality, you take that track mentality, is that when the church is on the track of your life, nothing else is on that track. Nothing else. It has an exclusive position, place, in your life. It has the exclusive purpose of your life. Think about that statement. It has the exclusive purpose of your life. What does that mean? When Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, what He is saying is don't just put it first on your list. He is saying it's not just a part of your life. He's not saying the church is a big part of, just make it the biggest part of your life. He's saying it is your life. It is your purpose. It is to be above all everything else. You may be here today and you think, no, that's not what it means. That can't be what it means. I've got to live. I've got to do stuff. I have other things about my life other than the church. Can you think about that for a minute? Certainly God tells us to work and to earn a living. But nowhere, and it, God tells us if man will not work, neither shall he eat. God tells us to have a job and to earn a living so that we can do good unto others and not necessarily do good so that we can have, so that we can help others. But does God tell us anywhere in our life that that's got to be first in degree? That that is our life? That is our purpose? No doubt God, God wants us to have a family. Wants us to get married. Wants us to have children. Tells us to take care of our parents. Tells us to love each other and as husbands and wives and to take care of our children. 
But what happens when that becomes the exclusive part of my life and not the church? Jesus, not this preacher, not this preacher, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. So the question this morning is, are we? Are we doing that? And what I want to do for the rest of this lesson this morning is just ask questions. Everything from this point on on the screen this morning is just going to be a question. It's going to be question marks at the end of every line on the screen. The title of this lesson, do you see the title of the lesson? The title of the lesson is a question. First, question mark. Is the kingdom of God first in our lives? Is the church of Christ first in our lives? Not first in time, not first on a list, not first. Is it the exclusive, prominent thing in my life, the way Jesus wants it to be? And so I'm going to ask a series of questions, and at the top of the screen it's going to say the same thing. It's going to say, can the church be first in my life if? I want you to think about that question. Can the church be first in my life if, and then we're going to start filling in some blanks after that. You see, the church, Jesus says, is a kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. The kingdom, any kingdom, has various parts to it in order for it to be a kingdom. So can we just ask ourselves these questions? You've got to answer these questions for yourself, not me. Can I say that the church is first in my life if its borders are not first in my life? And you say, what in the world? Borders, what are we talking about? You see, borders talk about who's inside the church, the kingdom, and who's outside the church. That's what a border does. Border defines who's inside and who's outside. So can I say... Can I say that the church is first in my life if I don't make it a priority to expand the borders of Jesus' kingdom so that more people are inside of His kingdom? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, verse 15. Can I say the church is first in my life if I am not trying to expand the borders and bring more people into His kingdom? Can I say the church is first in my life if I am not concerned about and seeking those who used to be inside the borders of His kingdom, but they've gone outside. That's why we're having a coming home Sunday. But you don't have to wait till a coming home Sunday. Galatians 6 and verse 1 and other passages are not concerned about a coming home Sunday. James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20 is not saying wait till a coming home Sunday. It's saying go and find those who used to be inside and are now outside, but can I say that the church is first in my life if I'm not seeking those the way God tells me to seek them? Can I say the church is first in my life if I am not defending the borders of His kingdom? You see, there are those who want to change where those borders are. There are those who want to change what someone needs to do in order to be inside of his church and say, well, it's okay, we'll just change this one thing and it not be a big deal in order to be inside of the church. Is it first in my life if I'm not defending the borders, the commandments, the conditions that God has placed in order to be inside of his church? Can I say it's first if I'm not doing that? Can I say the church is first in my life if I'm more concerned about other borders than I am about His borders? Nothing wrong with being concerned about borders, are there? You turn on the news and there's a lot of talk about borders, right? You know, who's inside and who's outside and who's guarding the borders and what's happening at the borders and nothing wrong with that. Guess what? Nations have borders. Did you learn geography? I mean, I, I learned, geography was one of my favorite subjects. Can you, can you figure out where all the 50 states are? That was one of my favorite things in school, is knowing where all the 50 states were. You know how you can tell where the 50 states are? They have borders. You know, Florida stops at a certain point and becomes Georgia, all right? There's that Florida-Georgia line right there at a border. So it's okay to be concerned about borders, but am I more concerned about helping those who are outside 
to get inside of his borders. Is the church really first in my life? Does it really have the exclusive prominence that he wants it to have? Is it really my purpose if I can't say its borders are first in my life? Can I say the church is first in my life if its laws are not first in my life? Ooh, laws. That is literally a four-letter word, right? Laws. We don't like laws. No, we, that, that do's and don'ts, that's, that's not fun to talk about. Why does God give us laws? The Bible tells us they are for our good always. Why did you give laws to your children? You were so mean. You told them not to run out in the street and play when cars were coming. Laws, laws, laws. You're so mean telling your kids not to do that. Why did you give them laws? For their good always. That's why God gives us laws. For our good. So that we know how to please Him. But can I say His laws are fir- can I say that the church is first if His laws are not first in my life? What does that mean? Can I say the church is first in my life if I don't love God's laws? Not just if I know them, if I can memorize them, if I can quote them. What if I don't love them? 2 Thessalonians, chapter two, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 10 talks about having a love for the truth. Sometimes people look at rules, they look at commandments, they look at laws. Oh, I don't like that. My response, God says, needs to be, I love that. The psalmist says in Psalm 119 and verse 97, I love thy law. Can, can we say that? Can we say when it, when it comes to God's word, I, I love everything it says, I love it. Everything it says, I not only love it, I want it. I go seeking after God's laws. Do you seek after laws? When, when, you, when, you are, when you're coming around a corner and you're exceeding the speed limit, are you seeking after particular law people out there? When you, come over, when you come over a rise and you're coming down the other side, are you hoping there's not some individual with some things on the top of his car sitting on the... Because you, you're not seek, you don't want them to be there. Sometimes we're not seeking and wanting law. Do we seek and want this law? Do we, Matthew 5 and verse 6, hunger and thirst after righteousness? You see, that's that's a whole different level than knowing it. That's a whole different level than quoting it. It's a whole different level than loving it when I go craving it, when I want it. But can I say the church is first in my life if the laws that I read about in this book are not something I love and that I crave and that I joyfully You see the word joyfully? That I joyfully obey. Did your children ever obey your rules but not do it joyfully? Huh, like all the time, right? Like 99.2% of the time, it was obey the rules but not joyfully. Does God want you to obey his rules but to do it kicking and screaming? But I did it, God, fine. Just check it off, God. I went and did it. Is that the way God wants us to do that? John 14 and verse 23, if you have love for me, then you will keep my commandments. You see, the keeping of the commandments is generated by a a genuine love for the Lord. And if I genuinely love the Lord, am I not going to passionately desire to do whatever He wants me to do? and to do it with joy and happiness in my heart. That may be a challenge for us. That may may be something that we need to really do some introspection on, each of us, to say, okay, I'm doing what He tells me to do, but am I doing it joyfully? Happily? When your kids gave you attitude, I mean, that one or two times. You remember the one or two times they did that? When your kids gave you attitude, okay, fine, I'll go and do it, and they did whatever you said, 
Were you okay with the attitude part? And some of you are like, well, if they did it, I don't really care. You think God's okay with our attitude? If our attitude's not right? When your husband or your wife does something to help around the house, but they do it with that look on their face, okay, I'll do it, fine. Uh Uh-huh, I'll do it, whatever. Be quiet, I'll do it, fine. And the work gets done? Does that attitude hurt? What about God? Can I say that the church is first if I don't do what he says joyfully? Can I say that the church is first if I am not somebody who would gladly go out and be somebody who would avoid, with joy and gladness, avoid doing what he doesn't want me to do? See, there's the things that I need to do, but there's the thing I need to avoid. Abstaining from fleshly lust that war against the soul, 1 Peter 2 and verse 11. Testing all things and abstaining from every, every form of evil, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 21 and 22. Do I have that? Do I gladly avoid what God wants me to avoid? Or am I like, oh, well, do I tell my friends, oh, well, I can't do that because I'm a Christian. No, I mean, you go have fun. You all go and do that. But I can't do that because I've got to, is it I've got to or is it? No, I don't want to do that. Because God doesn't want me to do that. And I will gladly avoid it because that's what He's called me to do. You see, God looks upon the heart. He doesn't just look on the outside to see what we're doing on the outside. God looks on the inside. Can I say the church is first in my life if I am more concerned about other laws than I am God's laws? Do I need to be concerned about other laws? Yeah, I better be. When you come over that high rise and you're coming down the other side, you better be concerned about laws. Do I need to be concerned about uh, IRS laws? Oh, let's not talk about that. It's not even tax season. Do I need to be concerned about IRS laws? Yeah, I've got got to pay attention to the laws. But am I more concerned about those kind of things than I am the law of God? I need to be able to say that He has that exclusive, preeminent position and purpose in my life, and that His church does far above everything else. Can I say that regarding His laws? Can I say the church is first in my life if its citizens are not first in my life? You see, we're talking about the church. What's the church? The church is the people. The church is the people of God. Can I say the church, the kingdom, is first in my life if its citizens, if its people are not first in my life? And again, not just rank, the, not just put them in order, not just make a list. Okay, I'll put the church people up at the top of the list. The word first as God is using it is a position of exclusive prominence in my life. Do I have that? Can I say the church is first in my life if I don't encourage my brethren? God tells me to. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 3, He tells me to exhort one another daily. Not just Sunday, but daily. Do I do that? Or do I just see the word daily is optional? Can I say the church is first in my life if I don't encourage one another? Can I say the church is first in my life if I don't serve my brethren? Galatians 5 verse 13 says, out of love, not out of grumbling necessity, but out of love serve one another. As you have an opportunity to minister unto one another in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10, do I do that? Can I say the church is first in my life if I don't do that? Can I say the church is first in my life if I don't practice hospitality? What does that mean? You know, there's, there's, there's a handful of times in the New Testament where God commands us to practice hospitality. 1 Peter 4 is one of those places where he says, Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Hmm, what does that mean? God looks at the heart. He doesn't just want you to check the box off. He wants you to do it with the right attitude. But am I hospitable? Do I have people into my home? Do I just ask people to go out to lunch? Maybe I don't have space in my home. Maybe I don't want them coming over and seeing my messy house. Do I take them out to lunch? Do I take them out to coffee? Do I spend time with my brethren outside the walls of this building? That's what the word hospitality means. 
Can I say the church is first in my life if I'm not doing those things as God has told me to do? Can I say the church is first in my life if I don't pray for one another? Isn't that James chapter 5 and verse 16 pretty clear? Pray for one another. We make announcements here every time we gather together. Every time we gather together, the lights are on, the air conditioning's on, and we make announcements. It's like, a, you know, just part of the deal. And a part of those announcements is talking about people who need our prayers. We, we print and we email bulletins out. We send out family news twice a week that has information about pray for these individuals. Why do we do that? Because we're a part of the church. And as a part of His church, God wants us to seek first His church which must include its people. Do God's people have a place of exclusive prominence above all my purpose in life? Can I say that the church is first in my life if I am allowing other people to have more prominence in my life than the church? Think about it. God certainly says, as we have opportunity, Galatians 6 and verse 10, as we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men. But he doesn't put a period, he just puts a comma. Do good unto all men, comma, but especially those of the household of faith. What does the word especially mean? Exclusive prominence. Above all, this is my purpose, is to look out for my brethren. Finally this morning. Can I say the church is first in my life if its king is not first in my life? You see, for a kingdom to exist, there are four essential components for a kingdom to exist. It has to have borders, it has to have laws, it has to have citizens, and it has to have a government. Our kingdom has a king. Can I say that His kingdom, can I say that the church is first in my life if the king is not first in my life? Can I say the church is first in my life if I don't spend time with Him every day? Outside of Jesus, my wife is my best friend. And has been since September 28th of 1993. Sorry. <laughs> Our anniversary is in July 1996. I had to think, did we start, that, that, that's our anniversary when we got married. I had to go back to 1993 to get September 28th when we first got together. Whew, okay, I remember the date. All right, what was I talking about? Okay, so... <laughs> Besides Jesus, she's my best friend. Can I say she's my best friend if I never spend time with her? If I never want to go home to see her? If the time's ready to go home, I don't want to go home. I, I, I want to go somewhere else. Not my best friend. But you see, there's somebody else who's got to be your best friend. But you can't say he's your best friend. You can't say you love Him if you don't spend time with Him every day. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, Colossians 3 and verse 16 says. Do we do that? Do we do that daily? Do we let His Word dwell within us? Do we meditate upon it day and night, as Psalm 1 and verse 2 says? We've got to spend time with Him every day. Can I say that He's first in my life if I don't love assembling? And there wasn't space right here, but I want you to put right here, assembling with Him and worshiping Him. Can I say the church is first in my life if I don't love assembling with you? I love assembling with you, but can I say He's first in my life if I don't love assembling with Him? Hebrews 2 and verse 12 says He's right here in the midst of our assembly. He's singing with us in the midst of this assembly. He's partaking, figuratively, obviously, I'll partaking of the Lord's Supper with us, Matthew 26 and verse 29. Can I say the church first in my life if that's 
not prominent exclusively in my life, that this is where I want to be. Every single time I can possibly be with him in this assembly, this is where I want to be. When David said in Psalm 122 and verse 1, I was glad when they said, let's go to the church building and they'll open those glass doors and we'll sit on padded pews in the air conditioning. You think that's what David was thinking? No. He's thinking, I was glad when they said, let's go spend time with God in his house. Assemble with him. Can I say the church is first? if that doesn't bring me joy? Can I say the church is first in my life if I don't long to give back to Him? Long to sacrificially give to Him? Not to give Him what's left, but to give Him what's right. To give Him what He deserves from me because He's given me all things. Can I say the King is first in my life if I do not every day eagerly long to see Him? Philippians 3 and verse 20 says Jesus is in heaven where our citizenship is and we eagerly wait for Him to return from there. Do you do that every day? Do you hope, do you eagerly hope to see Jesus every day? In fact, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13 says we ought to be looking for and hastening the coming of the Lord. Did you ever tell your kids, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Come on, we got to go. Did you ever tell your kids that? That's what we ought to be doing to Jesus Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Come on back, Jesus. I want to see you. I'm ready for you today. Do you love the king? Is he first in your life? Then there shouldn't be anything in us that says, oh, I I could wait a few years to see him. We ought to eagerly want him to come back and see him right now today. Can I say the church is first in my life? If somebody other than the king is first in my life, If I've allowed things of this world to invade my relationship with Him, if I'm more interested in pleasing people and friends and peers and the world than I am pleasing Jesus. Friendship with the world, James 4 and verse 4 says, is enmity with God. I can't be Jesus' friend and be friends with the world at the same time. I've got to pick. Who is my best friend? And the church can't be first in my life if he's not. But turn that around. If I am claiming that he is first in my life, how can I say his church is not? It's his body, it's his family, his kingdom, his church. May God help us when we think about Matthew 6 and verse 33. When he says to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, may God help us to not think about the day of judgment being a photo finish for us, like those races were. May God help us to not get to the day of judgment and hope, oh, well, I think the church came in first. Boy, it's going to come close, though. It's going to be a photo finish. But I, I'm pretty sure the church is going to be first when the Lord looks at it. it, it, but it nor do we need to think, well, I'm just going to laugh. And, and it's, it's going to be a long way out. I've really put, the, I've put, really put everything else to real distance behind the church. Wrong mentality. It's not first in time. It's not first in sequence. It's not first in rank or value. It is first in in degree that the church in our life must be above everything else. The central purpose of our lives with exclusive prominence over everything else. That's not some preacher's interpretation. That's looking at one word first. Looking at how that word is used in the Greek language and saying that's what Jesus is saying to us. May God help us. May God help us to make it first. Truly first. Where are you in your relationship with that king today? Where are you in relationship to the Lord and His church today? Is it first in your life? Have you been saved the way that the Bible tells us to be saved? Have you followed the laws that the Bible gives us to follow in order to become to be inside of the borders of His kingdom and to be one of the citizens of His kingdom and to be able to call the King 
your Savior? Have you done what the Bible says for that to happen? It's got to be done by believing that Jesus is the Son of God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. If you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus says you'll die in your sins. You've got to believe He's the Son of God, and with that faith in your heart, turn away from wrong in your life. Make up your mind to repent. Change the direction of your life. Turn your life over to the Lord. Are you ready to make that decision today? Some of you haven't made that decision yet. Are you ready to make that decision right now? decision that says, I'm ready to change who's king of my life. Not me anymore, him. If you're ready to make that decision today, you can do what they did in the New Testament in order to become a Christian. You can confess the faith that's in your heart. And this very day, you can be baptized into Christ to allow the blood of Jesus to wash away every sin you've ever committed. You know the blood of Jesus doesn't forgive your sins until you are baptized. Some of you are still hanging on to your sins because you haven't been baptized for the remission of your sins. Why do you want your sins? God doesn't want you to have your sins. He wants your sins gone. He wants to wipe them away. Why don't you get baptized today and allow God to do that? Wipe away every sin you've ever committed. You get added to His kingdom inside the borders, one of His citizens. You get your name registered in heaven. And He says from that day forward, just put the Lord first. Put the kingdom first in your life of supreme, exclusive prominence above everything else. If you need to get your life right with Him today, don't wait. Do it right now as together we stand and sing.